coming back for, for another session. Um, she has been with us before, and she's going to talk about being human, centering in the four dimensions. So um, before I introduce Caroline, just a couple of announcements from our side. Uh, Julia sends her regards. She can't be here today because she's traveling. And uh, that in and of itself is a fairly momentous um, situation. You'll see in the last couple of weeks, we've been traveling more again. Um, so hopefully that's a good sign of things to come. And in terms of just other Euphoria announcements, we have uh, three uh, accreditation programs coming up. For those of you that haven't done level one yet, our basic Enneagram accreditation, there's a program happening in the Europe and Africa time zone uh, from the 27th to the 29th of October. So please sign up for that and um, find out more. You can, you can, I think, private message Andrea if you want to know more or if you're interested in that. We have a vertical development identity maturation level two training program happening across shorter time uh, spans, September 22, 23, 29 and 30. And then we have a level three training program, which, which starts tomorrow. That's around teams. So if you're interested in any of those training programs, please let us know. Uh, otherwise, we're very happy to hand over to Caroline for her session. And uh, for those of you that weren't at Caroline's first session, she's an incredibly experienced consultant in the field of organization and leadership development. She's got more than 25 years experience and she's based in the UK. And um, she has some special programs also that will be running in October, which she'll tell you more about. Caroline, we are so blessed to have you here and uh, very appreciative of the work that you do in terms of supporting vertical development in the world out there. So without much further ado, we'll hand over to you. Thank you so much for a lovely introduction and uh, a heartfelt thank you to everybody here on the call as well. Uh, I have been looking forward to it. Um, as Lucille said, this is my second time. Uh, the first time I did a, like an introduction to somatic coaching. And this is developing on one sort of aspect of somatic coaching. Um, so a little bit about me. I'm trained as a psychological counselor, OD consultant and coach, certified in adult development theory and also um, in somatic coaching as well. So adult development theory and somatic coaching have had a huge impact on my coaching. They've both deepened how I coach and also enabled me to be in touch with my own embodied journey. Um, and I think I've become more compassionate as well to myself as well as to other human beings. And I think that's what's needed at the moment. Um, we need leaders, we need coaches like yourself, mothers, fathers, really who are in touch with their embodied life. Um, so what I'm hoping for is a conversation to have together, to be present for one another, to try out some practical activities and to see what emerges. And there's space for questions so you can either put them into um, the chat as we go along or just put your hand up or just speak as well as we're going along but there will be plenty of space to be able to, um, you know, to have those conversations and see what emerges. So the space, the email for this workshop um, started with the title, uh, Being Human and Centering in Four Dimensions. And it's a bit of a working title. I'm still not quite sure what to call this. I have run this as a program, which it was around 10 hours. So Condensing it into one call has been a challenge as always. Um, but I think what I wanted to do is to center it around these two questions, which are the questions which a lot of people are thinking about now. Um, so what's the life that you want and what difference do you want to make? And those two things being really entwined. Um, so that sense of centering, centering is a core practice for somatic coaching. Um, and in the Strozzi Institute, um, their sort of uh, practice, their core practice is centering in these four dimensions. And I'll talk more about that and we'll explore more about that. But the reason why we do that is by 
uh, centering in the four dimensions in a physical way, we're opening ourselves to a larger, more expanded awareness um, and more openness and more connectedness. And it's for the sake of what, really? Why are we here? Why are we here on this planet? Um, and also, as I've kind of intimated already, that sense of what happens when we become disembodied. Um, so in terms of purpose, I think it's important for us to stay in touch with our purpose as we go through our lives, because our purpose is something that changes as we go along, as, as we get to different ages in our life. And it's something that we can reconfigure, we can sort of work out what's important to us as coaches, as human beings, and then move towards that future. And I actually feel really passionate about this and about the role that coaches can play. Um, so coaches, you know, they have, we have a really important role, I think, in helping people to grow and evolve and become more embodied. And so it's, it's really thrilling for me to, um, to be here on this call with you and, and to see the sense of, of um, energy that's coming from you as well. And I invite you to play with the things that I, um, that I kind of, we, we do when we come up with. And that sense of play is quite important. Somatic coaching and adult development um, and other approaches as well lead to deep work. And uh, that's why I call my programs Somatic Sandbox. It's the idea that we're doing deep work, but actually we can do it by holding it lightly, by playing, by kind of having a different energy so we don't kind of get sucked into, into a heavier kind of energy. So um, like last time, I'm going to just start by sort of talking about honoring the wisdom in the room um, and just setting kind of the, the way that I like to um, sort of have the space of how we are together today. So that is um, one of the key principles of talks, of my coaching, and of my programs is the concept of witnessing. And witnessing is about giving space, giving time and trust to make sense of things. It's not about solving things. It's about being with each other, being present. So I'm asking you to, to be um, in that place. It's always your choice to opt in. Um, if it's uncomfortable or messy, then maybe searching for different ways of doing things. And certainly in the work that we do, you can touch um, on people's trauma with a, with a small t. Um, and so it's about being able to kind of learn ways of, if that happens, of being able to help somebody to hold that and do what they need to do to look after themselves. So if you need to switch off the screen, if you need to leave, if you need to ask a question, you need to stop doing something, whatever, you know, do, do what you, is, is right for you. Um, and always, I know this is being recorded, um, but confidentiality within that remit. So the agenda I've got is around uh, me stopping talking and moving into a practical activity, and then asking you to share that experience in the breakout room. Then when we come back, I wanted to talk a bit more about these four dimensions and what they mean. Um, and then another practical activity, which is experiencing the contrast between when you contract and you're kind of all, you know, contracted and, and, and sort of squeezed um, and when you're open. And so doing a practical activity again around that um, with a breakout room to sort of be able to talk about that, um, then come back some questions and answers and to close. And I just wanted to share my my program as well. I'm realizing that the date of um, doing it in October probably isn't good. So I would just say that I do run my program. So after the October date, uh, there's going to be a, um, a January date as well. So um, if you can't make it, then that's fine. I'm just having a look at kind of, you know, um, Andrea's kind of asked people to say where they are and what their mood is. We've got reflective, quiet, peaceful, angsty okay so I just want to sort of uh, have that sense of that we come on to these calls quite often we've jumped off from other things and um, you know we bring with us a sort of mood um, way of being and hopefully when we practice this centering activity uh, you can kind of I'll ask you again uh, what your mood is and we can see if it's shifted or not 
So now um, it's time to, to do a practical centering activity. Before, before I do, I'll just kind of say um, a little bit about why we centre. So centering is a core practice um, in somatic coaching. And the reason why is it enables you to have a sense of what it's like when your body is, um, is, is centred as opposed to when it is um, contracted or when it, it's um, tense or whatever. So it's that sense of being able to move from resilience, uh, from reactive to resilience and backwards and forwards, because as human beings, we don't always stay resilient. We, and we'll talk a bit about this um, later on in the call, but things happen and they kind of trigger us and we move into a certain sort of way of being, a shape. Um, and so the centering enables us to sort of be able to see that contrast. And when I work with clients in this way, um, it's a real insight sometimes or many times clients come with lots of things in their head and it's really hard to be able to kind of get beyond all of those things in their head. And if we do a centering, then somehow the conversation in the head shifts and perspective widens and it feels like there are different options that weren't available before. So you can do this practice either sitting or standing. Um, I prefer to stand. So if you want to stand, then, um, you know, just take your time to position yourself. You can do this uh, with your eyes shut uh, in terms of sort of, you know, the way that I do it. I do encourage people to do it with their eyes open because it gets used to uh, practicing centering actually in the moment in reality rather than kind of having to go off somewhere and, and kind of shut, shut your eyes um, and you can do it with your screen on or your screen off whichever feels more comfortable and as I said if you feel like oh you know I, I don't really like this or whatever then do what you need to do to be able to to kind of get yourself into a, a good place sometimes that can be things like um, just paying attention to your feet or tapping your thighs that, that those things can kind of get you into a different place. So, um, as I'm saying these things, don't just think them, but what I'd like you to do is to bring your attention to your body and to feel them. So I'm gonna start off by centering in length. So what I'd like you to do is to bring your head over your shoulders. So just take that movement and, and have a play around with what it's like if your head is over your shoulders. And then your shoulders over your hips. So it might be that you kind of, again, need to sort of move a little bit just to sort of see what it feels like to have your head over your shoulders and your shoulders over your hips. And then your hips over your knees, knees sort of slightly flexed, not locked and then your knees over your ankles. So it's a sense of um, a line and it's quite often called um, the human line of dignity. It's like can bridge between the ground and the earth. Um, and you find that in many different cultures. So our feet are firmly on the floor and yet we have a vision that is bigger than ourselves. And along this length, what we're doing is we're straightening and we're also settling at the same time. So those of you that do yoga will experience and remember this kind of sense of doing two things which sometimes feel contrasting. That sense of settling, so your hips, your thighs, your knees, your calves, your feet are all settling into the earth firmly on the ground. And your spine having a sense of the vertebrae, the spaces in between the vertebrae and imagining that space between your vertebrae, bringing your attention up your vertebrae, up your head to the top of your head and having a sense of being open to the heavens, to the sky. So we're straightening and we're settling. And in the sense of settling, there are places quite often where we are more contracted. So what I like to do is to run through those places and, and to look for some settling there. So bring your attention to your eyes 
and allow your eyes to relax. And quite often, it's not just the outside of our eyes, it's actually our eyeballs are tense and contracted. And that sends signals down the optic nerve to the brain that actually there's some kind of sense of needing to be alert. And so you're using up energy around that. So let your eyeballs relax, let your eyes relax and let your peripheral vision just kind of soften. So eyes are relaxed. And then we're going to soften the jaw. So let the tongue relax so the jaw is at the hinge and the chin and the tongue are relaxed. So eyes relaxed, jaws relaxed. Just half a centimeter or half an inch, raise your shoulders up a little bit, take a deep breath, and then as you breathe out, just let your shoulders down. You might want to do that one more time, just raising your shoulders up, taking a deep breath. And then as you breathe out, letting your shoulders go down. So thinking of your shoulders as like a coat hanger and on that coat hanger, all your muscles can kind of relax on it. So you're, you're relaxing all of the muscles around there. And then we're going to move to the breath. Um, so that happens in your abdomen. So just put your hands on your stomach, maybe your thumbs on your belly button. And then just allow yourself to breathe in. And if you're breathing in relationship with the system of your body, your, body, your belly will go out as you breathe in. And as you go out, breathe out, your stomach will go back in again. So you're kind of dropping your attention there to a deep rhythmic breath. And then turn your attention to your pelvic bowl. So like the shoulder girdle, the pelvic bowl has a lot of muscles going through, lots of tendons, lots of ligaments. Um, we have elimination there, we have procreation, we have sensuality, we have the center of the body around here. So a lot happens in this place. And so just tighten your butt cheeks, and then release, and then again, and then release. So having a sense of your eyes relaxed, your jaw, your shoulders dropped, your tension and your breath lowered, your pelvic bowl open, just checking that your knees are soft so that the energy of the body can move around down to the earth and to ground us. And this is us centered in length, straightening and settling. So have a sense of what the quality is when you're actually relaxed in your length, your feet on the ground, and whether there is a sense of a vision that is bigger than you, perhaps a spiritual, moral or ethical vision, and what it's like when you relax with gravity. And then we're going to move to centering in our wit. So feel your balance in your feet, balanced left and right, and at the knees and at your hips. You're having a sense of the width of your body, just opening up, your hips opening up, the rib cage opening up, your shoulders. And in this horizontal plane, it goes kind of left to right, but it also goes a three, big 360 around us. And this is the place where we relate to other people. This is where we make our boundaries, how far we want our boundaries to be. Do we want to make our boundaries closer to ourselves, to let people come in, to be intimate? Or do we want um, to have them stay at arm's length? Um, so having that sense of, of the connection with other people. And turn your attention to the clothes on your skin. So on the top half of your body, um, your shirt or your jumper or your cardigan. And have a, also have a sense of where your clothes are making contact with your body and where they're ending. And then turn your attention to your arms, to the space in between your trunk and your arms, the space in between your fingers. So beyond your own skin, beyond where your own body ends, that sense of kind of where you end and, and the air begins. 
And if there are other living things in the room, like a plant or an animal, or if you have an object that's precious to you, without turning around to look at it, just sense or feel that object also sharing the space with you. So this is us centered in our width, in that sense of connection with others. Now let's go to our depth. So depth is the front and back. And as we spend a lot of time looking at various um, handheld devices, phones, computers, etc., we're going to begin with our back body because quite often we don't really even notice our back body. So bring your attention to the space between your shoulder blades and have a sense of settling back and into your sense self. Sense your low back, the backs of your legs. And this is part of the depth that we have, the sense of what's behind us, where we can acknowledge actually all of those who have helped us get to where we are. Teachers, guides, whatever our relationship is with, with any of those people, with our parents, they have got us to where we are. Without, without those people, we would not be who we are and where we are. So allow yourself and imagine that in your sacrum, you're growing a wonderful dinosaur tail. And with that dinosaur tail, you can actually lean back onto that tail and let that tail just settle back and down so you're not pushed forward. There's a sense of sort of settling and being able to rest in that place. And then from the back body, we're going to move through the inside of ourselves, through all of the organs, our stomach, heart, lung, liver, pancreas, all the things which do the jobs automatically. We don't have to pay attention to them. They just, they just work. Coming to our front body, um, we're going to move our attention to the heart centre and to our lungs. So let your chest be more open, giving room to your heart, the literal heart and your metaphorical sense of compassion and your belly center being open. And in somatics, when we think of depth, depth, we think of that balance, but we also think of the depth of our being and what wants to come forward. So what is it that wants to come forward? What is that perhaps you've got on the peripheral vision or, the, or you can see in your full sight that wants to come forward? It might be a long withheld joy or a project or a relationship or maybe even an anger or a difficulty or something. But something wants to come from, through and what something wants to form. And through these somatic practices, we can begin to feel that into ourselves. So that's being centered in length and width and depth, centered in dignity, connection and safety. And the last centering place, the last dimension is centered in our middle. So what I'd like you to do is to put your hand on your belly button and your hand on your chest, on your heart. And just notice if you have a preference there for which way you want to have your hand and have a sense of, of how that feels when you have one hand on your heart and one hand on your stomach. And then move the hand that was on your chest through to your belly button and let the palm of your hand just rest there and feel the shape and the warmth and the center of gravity. And other traditions, it, it's in many traditions, um, it can be called Hara, Tantian, many other things, but it's that place where our sense of what's important to us, our purpose is held. And just notice it, while we're doing this practice, that sense of being centered in these four dimensions. Being centered in those four dimensions, ask yourself the question, what's important to me at the moment? What's important to me right now? And it might be that words come out. It might be a mood. It might be a picture, a metaphor. It might not even be that articulate. 
But whatever it is, allow yourself just to ask that question and see what arises. Notice if anything has shifted in your mood or if there are any images or any words that come forward. Just noticing around that sense of human, that line of human dignity, that sense of connection and making contact with the world, your boundaries, the sense of your depth, what's brought you to this place, what's... Um, What's, what are you seeing in the future? And what's it like to have that open attention? Just allow yourself to notice what is. And if there's in some place in your body, there was a sense of a numbness or not being able to sort of sense something, then that's fine too. It, it's a case of whatever is, is. And we allow ourselves to be able to see our bodies as, as a guardian, as, as a way of being able to um, protect us um, and keep us safe. And so that sense of compassion with the body is what enables us to be able to, without trying and make, trying to make things happen, but to allow things to dissolve and new things to come forward. So. When you're ready, just do what you need to do to come back to being uh, together in, in this room, many, many virtual rooms. And if you could just put your mood now into the chat and I'll have a quick look at what you're putting. got peaceful, relaxed and open. Grateful. And there's a lot around gratitude and the impact that, the positive impact that can have on our health. Thankful, thankful. Lovely. So before I, um, I ask Andrea to uh, put the questions into uh, into the chat and for us to move into breakout rooms to sort of share that has anybody got any questions they want to ask me we've got plenty of time for that I guess just a very practical question from my side Caroline if you're um using this practice with a coaching client in a kind of one hour session or whatever how how much time do you spend on it how how expansive are you in this practice yeah that's a good question so this particular version is the longer um centering and i have centering practices which take 30 seconds or a minute um and this is probably the longest so if I'm working with somebody for a number of sessions, then I will, particularly in the first session, do something so people get the real sense of what it's like to be centered in those dimensions, because being able to have a conversation about those different dimensions, that sense of safety, um, connection, dignity and purpose are always kind of quite key to what people bring. And so it gives people a felt sense of where something is and where they're curious as well. So I have a number of different um, coaching, not coaching, a different centering. And, and in fact, actually, in my program, that is one of the things that I do. I kind of share and different ones and, and people play with them. And, you know, people respond to things in different kind of ways. But sometimes it can be useful if somebody's got a really busy life to learn something that they can do that just takes them 30 seconds. Mm. Thanks. That's that's very useful. Um, Caroline, hi, Adam. Um, hi. Um, I, I, what I've been thinking about since your last session, because I loved your last session, and I then went and, 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 and I went and tried a number of 
um, the exercises that you did with us um, in in my immediate team and at work, and um, it was so interesting to see how different the response was. And I wondered, um, how do you know when an exercise like this actually lands in a team or when they, you know, because I had such a strong sense when you did it with us of my own difference before and after. And, and, and then we had quite amazing discussions, whereas with my immediate team, I found it quite challenging. And I wanted to throttle them and say, like, don't you get this? Um, so uh, how do you know when it's landed properly? Um, I guess, you know, for, for me, it would be whatever reaction is kind of, of what is. It's that sense of, of being with what is and, and allowing what is. Um, I do think with coaches, it's probably easier because coaches are open to that sense of um, being able to play with things and embrace things and try things out. Uh, having said that, I've had coaching clients who I've just kind of thought, oh, I'm not sure about doing this, but I'll give it a go. Um, I always start off when I'm doing that by kind of saying, this, this is something we can try out, we can play with, it's an experiment. And, and to be able to kind of enable people to feel like, oh, you know, that's not, it's not a task that I have to do, um, which can then completely shift kind of how they are with it, really. Um, but I have with teams, I have had somebody go, so it's sort of people sort of say, oh, I don't like that. Um, and sometimes it's because it, it, they notice things which had been pushed away. And actually, sometimes that can be quite difficult. Yeah. And, and I don't know if there's an element of um, your own sort of confidence, the more you do it, the more you kind of know that you can take the time and you can kind of allow space and things like that. I think when I first did it, I probably rushed it a bit too quickly. So I don't, I don't, obviously, I don't know if that was an element, but for myself, that, that was um, something about it as well. Does, does that help? Mm. Oh, that helps a lot. Thank you. Any other questions? Okay, so Andrew, can we just put into the chat what the question art is and then put people into breakout rooms? And I've given people quite a lot of time because I think last time there was a sense of really kind of enjoying being able to talk to each other and share, um, you know, what's on. So. Um, what's on your mind? So the questions are around, um, and I'll explain a little bit around that. So it's um, that sense of um, what do you, sorry, I'm kind of, that's it. What's your experiencing in centre in, in the four dimensions? So, uh, sorry, I'm looking at that. Um, so what insights does that bring to you about yourself and as a coach? So what I find is that because we all hold tension in different ways and in different places, we will, as Adam said, have quite different responses. And so it's something around what when, you know, parts of that might have just gone, OK, right, that's fine. And other parts you might have thought, oh, do you know what, that actually that 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 that's triggered something or, or, or brought something to mind or, or whatever. So it's really having that sense of um, what's, what insights do you have? Um, and be as, you know, again, as I sort of said at the beginning, sort of be as open or not as you want to be within this, okay? So does anybody have any question about the two questions? Nope. Everybody ready to go into breakout rooms? Okay, see you in a bit.
<laughs> you're still here, Nicole. <laughs> I'm still here. <laughs> It's weird. Your name didn't come up at first when I was. Let me. Oh, you see, I, I was. I came on my phone and then I had to switch to my laptop. Oh, uh, sorry. That's confusing. There we go. No, there we go. All right. Goodbye. Okay, bye. <laughs> and, oh no! Not goodbye. Oh, oh yeah. And also, Lucille is in a random room. I'm just. Kidding. I didn't know if she wanted to go into a room, so I put you two in a. Oh, okay. You know, I, I didn't know. So I, I rejected it. Oh, Lucille. Lucille, sorry. I'm sorry. I put you in like you and Caroline in a holding room because I wasn't sure if you wanted to. No, you I'm just, happy to go. Are you not in a silo? Yeah. Holistic yeah. view that. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Have we got everybody back? Was that enough time or too much time? No, right amount of time. Ah, that's good. That's good. Has, has room three gone missing? Alice has come back, but two people oh. had to jump on another call. Okay. Right. Yeah. Well spotted. Yeah. So has anybody got any reflections from their conversation or any questions that they want to ask? I think a reflection from our group, um, Caroline, was that all of us had almost all of us had this real response to the invitation to grow a dinosaur tail <laughs> and to lean back into it and a huge <laughs> sense of relief and oh. something really powerful happening from the dinosaur tail invitation oh, I don't know wow. what it is about that and this moment that did that for us but um if, I don't know if you want to say something more about that invitation because it's yeah, beautiful. Yeah, um, that is actually something that I came up with because um, when I when I went on my training, they were talking about, you know, they said, but back and down. So it was that sense of kind of like, and I kind of thought, oh, well, that's kind of almost like I've got a tail. And so then when I was practicing it, I was like, well, imagine that it's a tail. And then I was kind of thinking of Tyrannosaurus Rex he's got a big tail and I was just thinking what would it be like if you had this big tail that you could just kind of sit on and just feel quite comfortable on really and and kind of supporting you and um since then it has been interesting because when I've I don't always include it but when I have um I think it's something about and, and I haven't had any men have that kind of particular reaction to it but I don't know if it's women that it kind of tilts your pelvis in a different way Mm. And so rather than kind of being kind of inwards like that, it's actually tilting your pelvis in a more open way. And I think it's actually that sense of, you know, because as I said, your your pelvic sort of area or the area around your hip bones has got, you know, so much, um, you know, um, it's, it's just got so much in it, really, that uh, there's a lot happening there. And so if you mm. open it up, then you open up to very different sort of um, experiences that you you haven't had before. Mm. Different we sense. were all we were all women, so <laughs> yeah. Know how the men uh, felt yeah. about the dinosaur tail? Yeah, I'd be interested. Um, any guys on this call? Yeah, boundary engaged position. I like that, Claire. Yeah. 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 And, um, in in therapy, <laughs> there's kind of three positions that kind of. Uh, I moved through with my, my therapist and the one is uh, uh, flight which is this one and then there's fight which is the forward yeah. one which is where we all were yeah <laughs> and then the one actually which the dinosaur facilitates is your kind of boundary and engaged so it's a it's it's a very healthy position to be in if yeah. you will, actually so what it does in terms of how your body how, how it links what your body's doing with with, with your mind so yeah yeah, it's, yeah. That, that 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 is it's exactly the same position so maybe that has something to do with it yeah yeah I think so I think so it's interesting because on my last somatic sandbox program one of the um the women on the program had got to a point she'd been a coach for about 10 years and she'd got to a point where she was just like I know that what I'm doing with my daytime job 
isn't she was a nurse and so it's been really hard over the last 18 months she was like this isn't what I want to be doing um but I feel like I don't know kind of quite what to do and the dinosaur tail was the thing that just released the sense of like clarity it was really strange you kind of I could you know I was coaching her at the time and everybody it was I was demonstrating something or other with her and it, you could just see the the difference and and the shift in terms of the now I know it all kind of just went into place for her and and then we kept on practicing that because that's what a lot of the coaching is is finding those little micro movements that, that are the key to you as an as an individual person and then being able to kind of keep practicing that to be able to shift you know your shape and and actually that's a good segue into I wanted to talk about shape really because um, that's quite a core concept so you know the idea is that through our um, you know our upbringing our experience on you know many different levels so our family the society we're in the sort of geology that we're in you know the the social mores all of those things we develop a shape and that's the body um, you know taking a particular shape that's been quite hard earned and when a client comes in you can see that history you know before your eyes really of, of that shape and it's it's like a lifetime has gone into the tissues um, our metabolism our cells you know the shape of our experience and that shape has been created to keep us more keep us safe keep us connected to retain a sense of dignity as well um, but it becomes automatic. You know, we don't notice it. And actually, quite often when it's contracted and it's contracted as a, as a sort of way of, of being, we don't notice that. And, and I'm kind of wondering, Adam, whether, you know, when people tried it, actually, it was a bit difficult because you're kind of getting people to move from their normal sort of sense of where their body is to something different. And it's a bit like, oh, that, you know, just necessarily feel automatically how things are. Um, but in somatic coaching, that shape, our body, is we, we kind of regard it as a, as a guardian. It's that what's the body taking care of? It's that sense of um, it's a guardian which has got us to where we are and, and taken care of us for so long. It's the sum of our history. And that's where the somatic practices come in um, so that we can have new insight and new awarenesses. And by continually practicing those things, then we start to shift our shape. And I don't know if I mentioned last time, but I use myself as an example. So I practice centering when I was walking the dog, I still do. And by doing that, instead of kind of walking like this, you know, a bit forward and kind of quite, you know, I've got things to do. And, and my head was kind of, you know, thinking about things as I was walking along. Um, I centered and what I found was that I was in the here and now without kind of any effort to be it just shifted from being like oh thinking about the future to like okay I can see the trees and I'm more open to this and and you know etc um, and so it's that sense of that somatic practice now means that I've, I've shifted my shape it's become kind of how I how I am now so I've moved from one kind of particular shape to another through that um, somatic practice. And that's kind of part of what I do with clients is helping them to find those micro movements and then to be able to create a practice, which is the right practice for them. And it links to not just your physical body, but your mood, the, some words that are in, uh, what's important to you, uh, you know, in a sense. And that's, you know, I've talked before about that sense of purpose as well. So it kind of links to all of those things. And when we change our shape, you know, we, we release and we dissolve old habits, old ways of being, old interpretations, old stories. It, it's quite a lot of undoing rather than doing I would say, and, and that's kind of actually where some of the challenge is really, because, you know, we, we've got to where we have through probably, you know, hard won experience really. Um, but it's about, about becoming aware of our own shape and its wisdom and, and how we are, what we practice. And we can, you know, we're practicing something, whatever we're practicing, but we can intentionally shift our practices. Todd. 
Yeah, we had an interesting conversation along those lines. Uh, it was with Nazima and Adam um, about what differences you know we notice, and we'd love to hear. I'd love to hear from you. You know, that sometimes you know you can do something like a good hike that helps to bring a centeredness. And then, you know, there, and then there's also the version that we just did and that, you know, the, the intention you bring to it matters, but then there's also kind of a different mental physiological effect that each can have. I'm curious about the doing that helps being to you to be centered and then also more of like a non-doing kind of practice that helps you be centered. That's a very deep question. Yeah, and, and one that I'm really kind of quite interested in. I think for me, practicing somatic coaching has engaged me with something that's bigger than myself. So, you know, it is, it is kind of a sense of something spiritual. And within that, it's shifted my, how I do my doing. So I feel like I, I you know, the, the centering and, and all of these practices become just part of how you live your life. And so it feels like you do the doing from more of a sense of being. Um, and, and that's kind of, that's been the shift for me, really, I, I would say. Um, yeah, I, I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a really interesting question. And I think, you know, that, that sense of intentionality, which is what I heard, Todd, I, I think is quite key because, you know, quite often we walk around like heads on sticks. You know, we're just like take ourselves to the next meeting, take ourselves to the kitchen to do things. And we're like, we treat our bodies like it's a taxi for our beautiful brains. And, um, you know, somatic coaching brings an intentionality to getting in touch with not just the body in the physical sense, but the you know, the, the emotions, the, um, the intellect, the, um, you know, that sense of something that's bigger than you. So there, it, it's that, you know, soma, the word soma that the Greeks have, which is, you know, the body in all of its intelligences and all its aliveness. And so it brings an intentionality to that. And that's why I chose that video at the beginning. It wasn't just the song. It was the interaction between the mother and the father and the baby that you really got that sense of aliveness. And it really, you know, for me, it was about, you know, being safe, being connected and having that sense of dignity. And you just kind of thought, wow, for that, for that baby, you know, that baby was held and, you know, you, you, the whole of life just flowed between the three of them. Yeah. I think that's a really interesting inquiry. Yeah, one, one I resonate with quite a lot. Caroline, uh, a personal question for me, because it's something I'm trying to make sense of in my own shape and my own um, body movements. Um, I have, and so I'm working with a som somatic experiencing practitioner and I have for a number of years yeah but I have a particular movement which I can't seem to process fully so it keeps coming back and it is a movement where I involuntarily jerk yeah. back and it's interesting if I look at the shape even physical shape of my body yeah. I have this funny like protruding bit of my the kind of yeah neck spine connection right there as well and I I keep having keep processing keep yeah. processing this and when you were, were speaking about releasing old ways of doing yeah. and finding the micro expressions that can support us through that that's the one that I feel I've been processing for years and in this frame that you have around specifically I think the I mean back is part of the depth uh, but it's also part of the width in some way for me in terms of that. Yeah, it's just, 360. That 360. Yeah. So both of those being in mm. play there. But just any thoughts or, or things that you've seen around some of those kind of repetitive things that are so stuck in our bodies sometimes yeah. that, that come up. Yeah. So, I mean, I think it's a good example of, of a kind of us when we're in reactive so it, it's something that has been, you know, your body is done to, to protect yourself, really. It's kind of that moving back and kind of protecting 
your throat, mm. which is kind of vulnerable and, and kind of pushing yourself back as well. So it, it feels um, innately like a kind of uh, a protective reaction. Um, what's interesting and, you know, that I find with the with the exploring the clients with the micro practice is sometimes you can kind of be really aware of that. But that's mm. not the thing that will enable you to move to something else. So, yeah. for example, with the dinosaur tail, with my, you know, the lady that was on the program with me, um, it was the dinosaur tail that enabled her to shift the top part of her body. And mm. so by doing the dinosaur tail, you know, and I'm not saying that this is the case for you, but mm. for her, it was the case that it kind of unlocked everything else in terms of, of kind of the, the practice for her. It put her body into the place which actually was the... Okay, so this is what it's like to be centered. This is what it's to be like to be, you know, um, kind of, you know, um, alive in my skin and 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 kind of resilient. Yeah. Mm. Mm. So if I'm hearing you, um, sometimes the awareness of where the stuckness is doesn't give you the key to where yeah. the centering practice, the centering practice that I need to maybe unlock that in some kind of way so yeah, I had an invitation we're, 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 to explore where yes. it might lie yes play play with it really and, and actually the next practice I'm going to do is very much about that it's um it's about contracting so squeezing ourselves and then opening and and that can be a really good thing to do with people that um you know don't have any infinity with this or are struggling with it because you know in our sort of um our shape, our, our usual shape, there usually is an element of contraction. And so if we over contract, it's like then we can kind of recognize what is our norm. And also our body can learn to relax. So it doesn't necessarily relax into centered, but it's it experienced that contraction and then relaxing. And then I don't know if any of you have ever, you know, had something happen like a broken arm or something like that or a frozen shoulder. And the person's got you to kind of contract and then relax and contract to, so that the shoulder can learn to do new things. It's that same kind of process of, of playing around with it and, and kind of reteaching the body. But, um, you know, when, when you're coaching somebody in this way, you, you can see by their face and, and not just their face, their energy, when they've got the, the thing, which is like, the, they call it the keystone kind of keystone movement which then unlocks the other things so are you up for doing another activity okay so just remind myself okay yeah right so again what you can do is you can do this standing up or sitting down um, i prefer to do standing You've got and make sure that you've got plenty of space around you as well. And you can do it with your screen on or your screen off and with your eyes shut or open. So one of the best ways to find being centered is to feel the contrast with what's not being centered. Uh, so what we're going to do is we're going to practice this in these different dimensions. So first of all, we're going to practice with depth. So what I'd like you to do is to let your weight come a little bit more onto your heels. So you're kind of going back a little bit. You might back up a bit on your neck so that you're looking at the world from a little bit further away, almost like a sort of like, you know, keeping it more at arm's length. And then... Let yourself notice when you do this, what else that has to contract in your body when you're, when you're doing this and, and what it needs to do to hold this shape. And then I want you to go ahead and come onto your toes. So this is a kind of leaning ahead or pushing into the space that's ahead of you. And again, I want you to see what that produces what your body has to do to be able to keep that place um, and notice anything that comes to mind. And now I just want you to rock backwards and forwards between your heels and your toes until you find the balance back to front and front to back. You find the place that actually feels like that you're 
you're balanced in your depth. And then we're going to do the same thing with width. So what I want you to do, first of all, is to narrow yourself. So it might be drawing your shoulders in. It might be bringing your feet closer together, narrowing your vision, tightening your face. And then again, once you're in that position, really noticing what it's like to take up so little space and to be so narrow. And again, what's needed for your body to hold this shape. And then try out the opposite extreme. So your feet are wider than your hips, your arms spread out as far as you want. Maybe your chest is pushed out a bit. And it's kind of a bit of a, quality of a push that you're going to feel the space that's outside of you and again noticing what you have to do with your muscles and your intention attention in order to hold this space and then again allow yourself to kind of play with the being small and being um, being narrower and being wider until you find that you're actually in a place where your arms and your legs and your trunk are taking up the space that you wanted to with a centered width. So your arms are nice and relaxed, your feet are kind of where they, they feel that they are uh, a good amount apart and your peripheral vision is open as well. So now we're going to look at length. So first of all, I'm going to ask you to go extra length. So this is kind of standing on your tippy toes, might be like arms up. But again, it's about being taller, as tall as you can be. And again, from the inside, let yourself know what it's like to exaggerate from being up as high as you can. And then what you what you need to do to be able to be bigger than you are. And then we're going to go to the opposite extreme. I'm going to disappear probably. So we're going right down, shrinking your left, collapsing your chest and your shoulders, letting your eyes come towards the floor and let yourself feel the mood that this produces. What's the story of this shape? And again, just let yourself center, recenter at the right size length for yourself, neither going up too much or shrinking away from anything. And just make a note of one or two sensations in your body that let you know that this is a relaxed and enlivened length for you. Um, for me, there's an ease along my spine, my eyes are softer. So what we're doing is we're building up more distinctions in our body. Um, and also we're kind of finding the kind of places that we come back to under pressure um, or when stress increases. Uh, and now we're going to just move to the center. So contract your belly, contract your body, again, making up less room, contract your depth, your width, make yourself smaller, contract your length, make yourself shorter. Put your hands on your belly and then just feel what that does in terms of the mood, the story of that shape, how it relates to the sense of what's important to you. Now take a full breath and breathe into your full length, your width, your depth and your centre. So let the contractions go. Let yourself experience the letting go of that contraptions and the shape of your body, and your mood. And sense the difference that you, when you organize your awareness, your attention and your sensitivity to this field. Just notice what it's like now to be in this place. And um, as you come back to being back in the group, try and keep as much of the shape as possible. Sometimes when we're in transition, we kind of drop from the practice and we go into business as usual. So just notice if you do that, um, but see if you can actually kind of keep some of that shape and, and maybe what the little micro practices might, the micro movements might be. And uh, some of what we do when we're, you know, when I'm working with clients is being able to find that sense of presence and in different contexts. 
So if you want to stand, uh, sit if you've been standing and put your screen on if you've had it off. Um, so, you know, we are what we practice really, and we're always practicing something. So, you know, with me, my eyeballs were always tense. My jaw was always clenched. Um, and now it's it's a real joy that that's not my permanent position because it's actually quite tiring. Um, so, you know, that is our sort of automatic response under pressure. But what happens is, is it then becomes our way of being. And, and that's kind of what we find with our clients. It's become their way of being. So, um, again, we've got sort of time just before um, we go into breakout groups. It, has anybody got any questions or any observations from that? No. Um, I, I have a question. Hmm. Do, do you, when you start, they're also very practical. When you start these, do you, do you actually have a script in front of you or do you just know the stuff? Um, both. So when I first started, I had a script, um, like the long um, centering that I did at the beginning. I, I know that one now. The one with the, um, the movements, I, I sometimes forget aspects of it. And so I have a like just a few words to remind me so that I don't miss out one of the dimensions. So, yeah, I mean, in terms of, um, you know, using it online, I guess that, you know, you can you can. I, and what I would say is practice with people, with coaches, with with friends, with relatives and stuff like that, and and kind of get more uh, used to being able to talk it through. Because what you'll find is if you're using a script, then sometimes it can feel a bit like jerky or something. Yeah. Um, an observation from my side, Caroline. Um that movement, especially towards the end, where we kind of fully contracted around the center and came back out of that, was incredibly emotionally, it, it was very evocative for me from an emotional perspective. Um, mm, and, and quite, I wouldn't say, I don't know if it was quite a release, I don't know if it was the contraction or the coming out of the contraction exactly that did that. Yeah. But there was something incredibly emotionally activating from that. And I'm, I'm wondering if you can say something about that. Yeah, so, so that is, I don't know if I shared the, the term condition tendency, but that's kind of the term that we use, which is that conditioning that our body has taken on to be able to keep us safe. and. Um, you know, there is a lot of energy stored in that and it becomes the norm. And so actually shifting that releases not just energy, but it can often release um, emotions, sadness, grief. You know, it, it quite often, you know, we, we all go through life and we experience some level of trauma with a small t. You know, we experience people we love leaving us or dying or you know, physical accidents or, you know, we all experience those kinds of things. And what happens is that our body, you know, tries to keep us safe. And if it's more of an extreme thing, then it, we, we tend to just kind of um, push away some of the things which are really difficult for us. And so we'll, you know, we'll kind of push them away, we'll box them off, we'll, you know, kind of disown them really. Um, and I, I very early on when I trained as a, as a therapist, I trained in gestalt therapy. And I think I intuitively knew that was the right thing for me because it's that sense of bringing the disowned parts back in. Um, and and that there, there can be a lot of all of that, you know, emotion and, and everything else that was felt then can it, it comes back in. But, and that's why the concept of compassion is so important because if you're fighting with yourself and that's where I think a coach can really help somebody to learn that so you know to show that self-compassion because when you're fighting with yourself that just then becomes like you're at war with yourself whereas you have that sense of your body being your guardian then it's like oh, okay you know I know you know it's like for myself I kind of know when I've kind of got my crazy starey eyes and my chest you know clenched jaw and everything. I'm like oh yeah 
okay that's that's the body it's 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 reacted to something i haven't noticed it's reacted to something which actually feels like potentially there's a stress and and i've just gone into that automatically but it's, it is you know it's one of the things i mean because i've trained as a as a counselor and as a coach i'm kind of very for me i feel quite comfortable with that polar not clarity but that continuum around coaching and therapy so I kind of for me coaching is around the here and now and being able to work with somebody on the here and now if they feel that they need to go and kind of really look at the past and kind of go to that that would be when I would signpost them to some, somebody else or if they were dealing with some really deep trauma then I would be signposting them to somebody else and you know the ICF they have a really good white paper where they talk about trauma and and how to signpost people and kind of you know where where the you know what what coaches need to be mindful of are you ready to go into breakout groups to just talk about that so andrea do you mind alistair has a question oh sorry alistair i didn't see you oh yeah. it's because this is the yellow hand yeah <laughs> That's all right. Um, something you just mentioned now um, about the the scope of coaches um, versus counselors, right? Um, um, I'm doing the Euphoria Trauma course, and last night was our first night doing it. And um, I like what she said, um, Ingrid. She said the like when you're dealing with addiction, right? The addiction is the is the cure the problem is actually the trauma that happened back then. And now the person's got into addiction. So now the, the, the counselors, are, they deal with addiction, right? And they're not dealing with the root cause. So my argument is, it, if you're gonna refer someone to a counselor who's got, I don't know how many letters next to their name, but they're not gonna cure the trauma. They're gonna go to the addiction. All right, yeah. You know, so aren't, aren't we as coaches the ones who should take up that um, you know, responsibility to do the coaching together with the trauma because we've, we know what we, I guess we can identify the trauma. Whereas I think in my experience, most of my friends who've gone to like therapy or, like addiction counseling, they always relapse, you know, and yeah. it's because you're not focusing on the, yeah. on the problem. So what are your thoughts on that in terms of- well, um, I guess like coaches, there are many different kinds of coaches and there are many different kinds of therapists. And, you know, what you might be talking about is more of your sort of cognitive behavioral therapy or something where it's a series of like, you do this step and you do that step and, da, 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 and, and something might happen. Well, you know, hopefully will happen for you. Um, and that's very different from, you know, for example, a psychodynamic therapist who would actually be really kind of um, finding more about the trauma and being able to help you to reintegrate that. So um, for myself, if I'm going to refer on, I always make sure I know who I wouldn't just refer on and not know the person. So I okay. would have a sense of, you know, who they are and what they do. And you know, I'm, I, you know, I did train in CBT, but I'm not a great fan of it because um, I don't find it as effective as, as other things. Yeah. Cool. Thank you. That's helpful. So we're ready to go into group. Lucille, do you have the um, questions to go into the chat or... Yeah, I've got them. I just wanted to know how many people we should have per room. How many would you like? Um, three and four, really. I think. Yeah. Okay. yeah. I lost you for a moment what's there, Andrew. What's, what's the question? So um, if I just, if I put it into the chat, if you just bear with me. So the question is, do you recognize your contracted shape and what can you see about your somatic shape? And when I talk about somatic shape, 
remember I'm using the word somatic in that sense of the body and all its intelligence. So it's the sense of, you know, spiritual, intellectual, your emotions, your mood, as well as your sensations that are happening in your body as well. So there's that sense of, you know, that that wholeness that you have with the word somatic. And then is there a particular shape which gives you some insight into sense of safety, dignity, connection and purpose? Are those clear, those questions? Okay. So should we say, oh, um, 15 minutes? 10 minutes doesn't feel long enough. Here we are again. That right, seventeen fifty one. Yep. Yeah. Right. Do you mind if I join a room? No, of course I don't. See. No. Okay. Okay. See you in a minute. All right. Let me see if I can even get there. <laughs> How, how is that conversation? There's two conversations. I'd love to hear about it. Okay, I'll go. Um, Thanks. Um, we could have gone on for a lot longer, it felt like. Um, we talked a lot about shape. Um, it was really in, we, uh, um, in, in a number of different ways. The one was um, around shape and uh, 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 someone in our group was, 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 was working with, so we talked about shape and then someone in our group is working with somebody who's obese and how does obesity and thinking about shape uh how do those two interplay i thought that was a really interesting mm. question or a disability or a, mm. or a, a something mm. how, how does that work um mm. um and then also yeah i suppose the other part of our discussion was about bodies taking on shape and and and, and I, I i just had a confessional about about my body noticing over the last sort of three years as my body takes on this shape which is quite different which was very much what you what you were saying earlier, Carolyn, about walking your dogs and feeling like you're going forward. Mm. And, and my, I can feel my whole body is in the slightly contracted forward leaning center as, as I try and kind of model and manage my world. Mm. <laughs> and I can see that I, that I need to put my head back and, you know. Yeah. Yeah. But but I thought the obesity I thought that was a really interesting observation. Yeah, yeah, and um, I mean I guess I have thought about I haven't thought about it in terms of obesity, but I have thought about it in terms of people's different abilities and everything. And I guess it comes back to that sense that the body is taking care of something or other. Um, so of course, you know, there are, there might always be medical reasons, um, but quite often that sense of, you know, who we are inside, we, we, you know, that doesn't get treated, does it? It's what Alistair was saying around, you know, kind of what we bring um, and maybe trauma that we bring as well. So I guess, um, I, I, yeah, it'd be interesting. I haven't really worked with anybody in that way and it would be interesting to see whether you know those ideas I think the idea of compassion and that sense of the body taking care of is still hugely important um, because you know we, we do get kind of stuck in a certain way of being and it, it's it's you know some I think some I can't remember who it was but somebody said the body opens with a yes 
you know, if, if there's a no or there's a fight, you, you automatically contract and then you're back in that sense of being in the same place. And in terms of, Adam, of what you said around that moving forward, I, I do wonder if it's something to do with all the devices we have kind of pulling us in, you know, we're kind of down on our phones or we're sitting in front of Zoom or something like that. And I have to say, that's why I really like somatic coaching, because it gets me standing up and my clients are moving around and I'm moving around and and actually brings an intentionality so that, you know, I'm learning ways of not just going into that um, and then that becoming my my norm. Interesting conversation. What about the, uh, we've got time just for one more. Um, nope. Okay, um, well, I think you're supposed to finish on the hour. So I did just want to say um, that I am running another, what I call somatic sandbox program in October. Um, and I will be running another one in January as well. Um, and this, you know, what I've talked about in terms of those four dimensions, that is a program I've run in the past. So I might well be doing something which looks more at um, safety, connection, dignity and purpose in, in more depth, really. So kind of really go into you know, what those different things are to us as human beings. And certainly the concept of dignity, I think, is one that's really important. And actually, you know, we don't see a lot of um, conversation about it. And if you are interested, um, there's a woman called Donna Hicks, who's written a really great book. Um, and I, I would say that she's at the sort of forefront around being able to frame what dignity is and, and the importance of it as well. Um, so if it's all right with you, I will put um, my information around my program there um, because of the, I hadn't kind of quite realized when I set my fees that UK prices are so expensive in terms of your currency. So I have actually done some um, some offers at the moment. So there are some discount codes there as well. Um, and I'm sure Andrea will send those around as well. Um, but yeah, so I, it's been a real pleasure working with you today. And um, I do hope that this talk and, and the previous talk gives you a little bit of confidence to start to dip your toe into somatic coaching or to, to try things out a little bit more. And, uh, and again, certainly if you want a safe place to try things out, because I do very, very strongly believe that as coaches, we need to go through the path ourselves first of all before we really kind of do deep work um, in this way with our clients so um, if you want a, a place to be able to play with it then then you know where to find me thank you so much caroline and thank you for leaving all of us um, in a more grounded safe and centered place within Lovely. us well that is important um, yeah. So thank you so much for what you've brought and your great wisdom around working with the body and how the body is part of the coaching. It's not a kind of coaching. It is always there and um, an invitation for all of us to bring not only to our clients our sense of wisdom that comes from that somatic intelligence, yeah. but to also support them being in in relationship with that somatic intelligence through the way in which we work with them. Yeah. Um, I've really enjoyed the session and yes, just deep, deep, deep gratitude. And thank you so much for your generosity and for your time. Oh, it's a here. pleasure. It's a pleasure. It's my passion. So I, I love talking about it and sharing it with people. That's really what, uh, what motivates me. Yeah. I'm glad, I'm glad that people found it useful. And thanks so much for the discount codes for us. Uh, yes, our currency, especially here uh, on the African continent, is uh, not, not friendly in its relationship with the pound. No. Um, so thanks so much for that. And thank you, everyone, for coming to this. I know a couple of you are also on Ingrid's uh, trauma course at the moment, which ran last night. So um, thank you for being here and for doing your work and learning with all of us 
Julia will be back next week. Andrea, do you want to announce just what next week's um, session is about? I'm not sure myself. Um, offhand, I cannot remember. Okay. Perfect. Look at your mails to see what next week's <laughs> session is about. Um, clearly, that's not top of mind. Uh, but thanks so much, and we'll see you next week. Thank Bye, you. Bye, everybody. Thank you. Bye.